May you be blessed today for being in the assembly of the saints and, and for offering your time to worship God today on this day that really belongs to him. Picasso, the, the famous artist, once asked his friend Rodin, another famous artist, if he liked Picasso's latest painting that he was just uh, preparing and it was as yet, as of yet unsigned and Rodin studied the painting from every direction and only after careful thought he answered Picasso. He said, whatever else you do, sign it. If you do that, we'll know which way to hold it. <laughs> now sometimes things can be kind of confusing, can't they? A little too confusing sometimes. And more complex than they need to be. If a person were to sit down today and, and take a look at world religion and try to figure it out, that would be a complex project, would it not? And if they tried to, to simplify the task to just look at Christianity, it might be easier by a few degrees, but still way too complex. There is much religious confusion in our world. There is much religious confusion among those who claim faith in Jesus the Christ. There are way too many churches, way too many different beliefs and convictions and teachings. It really is a big mess that I'm sure God never intended for believers. He never intended it to be this way, but I'm certain that he knew it was going to be this way. He didn't want it for Christianity, but he predicted it. One of the places he did so was through the words of Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul wrote, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having Itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, this is a clear prediction from the first century of coming religious confusion among those who claim loyalty to Jesus. And it didn't take long for this to happen and it has only gotten worse over time. Until our time today when there are thousands of Christian religious groups teaching all kinds of different things, some from the Bible and some from without. Those who say they serve Jesus are divided and confused and they're saying a lot of different things about a lot of different things. It's really quite a contrast when you read the New Testament and read about just one church. Now, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4 that there is one body. In fact, in the same context, the apostle says there that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But if you were to look at it today, there are a lot of different Christian faiths and a multitude of bodies, churches, and many different baptisms. So quite a contrast with what Jesus, the one that everybody in Christendom claims loyalty to, quite a contrast with what he prayed for. In fact, he prayed for that on the night before he died. He prayed that all his followers would be one, just like Jesus and the Heavenly Father were one, that they would be united. And, and Jesus prayed that, that that would be how it would be for his future followers. In fact, Jesus prayed that they might be 
perfectly one. In John chapter 17, verse 23, if you want to look at his words there, his prayer was that they be perfectly one. Why? That the world might believe. That the world might believe. We wonder sometimes why evangelism seems so difficult in our world. Well, think about it from the perspective of an unbeliever sitting down to look at Christianity, to consider it, to try and figure it out, he'd have more luck with Picasso painting. We are so confused, that is, we who believe in Jesus, we are so divided. Jesus said that he wanted his followers to be one people so that the world might believe. Now, I suppose there are two ways that this problem might be approached. On the one hand, we could pretend to be one. That's what many in the religious world today try to do. They, they pretend. It's the ecumenical approach. That is, that, that we all believe in Jesus. We worship the same God. We are united in that and so we are one. And so we should just sort of act like we're one and forget about all the different things that we believe and all our different approaches to scripture and just ignore all that stuff and sweep it away, sweep it under the rug and pretend that we're actually fulfilling what Jesus prayed for and what his apostles wrote about. That's one, one approach. The other approach is the plea for restoration. It is to say, we have the word of God. We believe it's from God. We believe it's inspired by his Holy Spirit and that it is right in every way. Is there some way that we can just read and study and listen to the word of God and to the word of God only and do what it says and only what it says and let it unite us in a real authentic way. It's the restoration plea. Now it's not near as popular as the ecumenical approach, but it is much more biblical. Let me offer you just four or five things today that makes this plea, the restoration plea, different than anything else that's out there in Christendom. Now these are foundational things. I don't intend for this to be an exhaustive list, and I, I certainly hope it's not exhausting to listen to, but it is, uh, there are other things that we could talk about, but, but it is foundational and it's different really from what anybody else in the Christian religious world is saying to our world right now. So consider this with me for just a few minutes. Why is the restoration plea unique and different? It's different because it says that the only head of the church is Christ. Now in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, just before Jesus ascends back to heaven, as he's giving his final instructions to his followers about going into all the world and preaching the gospel, he says this. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's the words of the Lord. All authority... In heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is a pretty exclusive statement, if you think about it. Jesus uh, often made exclusive statements. And this is certainly one of them. He says, all authority has been given to me. All authority everywhere, you see. It all belongs to Jesus. And he does not share authority with anyone. Not with me. Not with you. Not with some bishop. 
not with a pope, not with an elder. No one. Jesus is in charge. He is the authority. He's king, you see. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 says, And he, Jesus, is the head of the body of the church. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? Again, pretty exclusive statement. There is one head, one authority in the church that belongs to God, and that head is Jesus. Now, if all believers in Jesus would accept that teaching and submit to it, it might not solve 100% of all the confusion in Christian religion, but it would go a long way toward making things a lot clearer to people who are looking at us, you see. No head but Christ. The second thing about this restoration plea that makes it different is that it calls on people to strive to make the Bible their guide in everything, in, in matters of faith and practice. The Bible is to be our guide. If Jesus is truly the head of the church, that's point one, then the word that he brought should be our guide in all things. We don't need any additional revelation uh, be it another book or a so-called whisper of the Holy Spirit privately or the written orders of some ecumenical council. All we need is the book of God. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 should be a text you have memorized. It says there, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. The Bible is pretty clear throughout that everything we need for life and godliness is found within its pages. Why? Because of who it comes from, because of its source. God. This book comes from God, you see. Now, if we could persuade believers in Jesus to take the word of God only as their guide for spiritual matters, for daily living matters, once again, how much less confusing things would be. Third, and it, this closely related to the second point, the restoration plea is different because it encourages and it permits each person to read and study the Bible for themselves. Now, down through the ages, there have been many different Christian movements, so-called, that forbid their members from studying things out on their own. That may seem, sound strange to us, because we certainly don't do that, but there are many who have done that through time. People have suppressed the study of Scripture in many ways. Sometimes it involved preventing the Bible from being translated into a language of the common people. That's happened down through the millennia since Christ walked this earth. That's one way. Sometimes people are just told, don't read your Bible. They taught instead that what you need to do is, is listen to some man, some approved person to tell you what you should believe or understand about God's will and about his book. And they wrote statements uh, of faith and, and creeds and force people to memorize them so that they would know what to believe. And every splinter group had a different one. That is not what we see 
in the Bible. Over and over in the Bible, we see people encouraged to pick up the Word of God and to read. One time, Paul and Silas, early missionaries, they're up in northern Greece, a little city called Berea. And they came to that place and they, they preached Christ from the scriptures to the people there. And you know what those crazy people did? They took the time to individually search the scriptures to see if they were being told the truth. The people up in Berea. Imagine. And they are highly praised for that by the, the author of Acts, who is Luke. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, you might remember this passage where he sort of comparing them to people in another city. He says, now these, that is the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, Examining the scriptures daily, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I mean, if, if, if Paul, the great missionary, the great apostle, great preacher, if he wasn't good enough to trust his word, who is? Surely not me. And yet, even today, from time to time, I will encounter people who look to some preacher, some pastor, to tell them what to believe. Or who depend a little bit too much on the minister to give them spiritual sustenance when really they have the same opportunity to feed on God's word as anyone else. And they ought to. It's amazing today the access we have to the word of God as compared to other ages. You have them on electric devices now. There is no excuse. And see, that is the pattern of New Testament Christianity. Checking it out yourself. Making sure what you're being told is true. Depending on a preacher is error. Imagine if all believers in Jesus were encouraged and permitted to study the Bible for themselves without the interference of any false authority, without some creed book to mislead them, just them and the inspired word of God. It gets much less confusing, doesn't it? I'll never forget, this is years ago, a lady started coming into our assembly where we were at the time. and She'd come from another group uh, where they were discouraged from reading the Bible for themselves. And one of the first things we did was give her a Bible. She had never been given a Bible. And she had been a Christian for years, for decades. And I'll never, never forget, it almost <laughs> brought me to tears, her excitement to have a Bible and be encouraged to read it for herself. But I would say probably the majority of believers in the world are in a similar situation. Fourth, the restoration plea is different because individual groups of believers, congregations of Christians in various localities are autonomous and self-governing. What does that mean? It means there is no hierarchy on earth that they answer to. There's no national conference that they report to. There's no authority outside of Jesus 
who, remember, is the head. He is the head of the church. And his, he has leaders that are chosen in these local individual congregations. These local leaders are totally under the authority of Jesus the Christ. They don't have any authority of themselves. They are under his authority. And they're chosen by local believers based on what they read in the New Testament. And, and so they are chosen by the authority of Jesus Christ. These men are called elders or shepherds. And we see this happening in, in the earliest churches of the New Testament era. For example, if you glance at Acts chapter 14, it's an interesting case. Paul and Barnabas, early missionaries, they're on their first missionary tour through what we today call Asia Minor, um, the area of Turkey in, in modern terms. They're traveling through this area, preaching, planting churches. They go to several cities in succession. They preach the gospel of Christ. They baptize believers. They plant new churches. Before they left the area, though, according to verse 23, Acts chapter 14, it says that they appointed elders in every church. Elders. Notice the S. Plural. And in every individual church, they did this. So there's no single elder, which much of the religious world today calls a pastor. None of that. Elders are appointed. And also, there's no single congregation that is exercising control or authority over any other congregation. You have independent congregations, autonomous as far as this earth is concerned, but all of them are under the authority of Jesus the Christ, who is the head. You see how much simpler it could be in the Christian world. If, I, if, if other believers would throw off all these man-made shackles of presbyteries and dioceses and councils and hierarchies and conferences, it would be much less complex, much less confusing, and much more appealing to the world. God's way always is. Fifth and finally today, the restoration plea is different because it recognizes that there has been a great apostasy, a great falling away from God's original plan for the church. And it mourns that. It mourns the fact of all the divisions among believers in Christ and realizes that all such division, all such denominationalism is sin before God. It is a departure from his way and totally foreign to the New Testament. And it pleads for a return, a restoration to God's way. Just like Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, see, people have turned away from the truth and wandered off into myths. Now, Paul used different words to say the same thing over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There he refers to a, a great rebellion that was coming. He predicts is coming. He also talks about a man of lawlessness who would be revealed and, and who would destroy things. And then, then again, Paul earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 said that the, the Spirit told him that some would depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and to the teachings of demons. Well, that certainly has happened, see. That's, that's what we see around us in the world 2,000 years later. And that's the answer to the question our world often asks. 
which is why are there so many different churches? I can't tell you how many times I've heard that question. Why are there so many churches? Well, if they'd listened to me for a half hour or so, I could tell them, like I've told you this morning, this is the basics of the explanation of that. Another question I often hear is, you know, what does your church teach? Or it, it may be expressed in a different way, uh, you know, why do you do this or not do that, you know? And, and often we have um, visitors to our assembly that, that may wonder things like that and may ask questions like that. And I'll just assure you that at least part of the answer to those questions is covered under these five things we've talked about today. There may be some more detail needed, but basically the answer why we do or don't do or, or why the world is the way it is is covered in these things. I tell you this morning that there is a church that's saying something different. It is God's church. The church that belongs to Christ. And when it is being faithful, it pleads with the world, that is the religious world, to come back to the Bible and to submit to Jesus only and to be reconciled to God. It's a restoration plea. And it's part of what we're about in this world. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for these good people who have given this time this morning to be together and to be before you. We pray that you have been glorified. Help us to be diligent students of your word, to always check the things we're hearing by it, because we know that is where truth is found. Thank you for hearing us today. We pray your special blessings on all those in need and we pray, Father, if there are folks here who need to make a change in their life this morning before we dismiss, that they'll have the courage to come and ask for prayer or help in their obedience, whatever it might be. Thank you for your love in Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. This morning, if you need to come in some way and, and uh, share something with us, ask us to be of assistance to you, won't you come? Let's stand. Let's sing.